Thank you for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm here to tell you today about a formal proof of the independence of the continuum hypothesis. Uh, OK, so uh, the continuum hypothesis was posed by Cantor in the 19th century. Right? Um, that there exists an infinite cardinality which is strictly larger than the natural numbers, but smaller than the power set of the natural numbers. Uh, this was Hilbert's first question. He had a famous list of 20 or so questions that he presented at the first International Congress of Mathematicians. This was number one. Um, and it was unresolved until the 60s when uh, Paul Cohen invented forcing, um, continuing work uh, by Gödel. Uh, his invention of forcing earned him a Fields Medal, the only one that was ever awarded for a work in mathematical logic. Okay, so uh, mathematicians thought it was important. Um, okay, and it's never been formalized. So how I heard about this problem was, uh, so I was in Vietnam with uh, Tom Hales at a formal abstract summer school, and uh, we wanted to compare lean to the other theorem provers. Uh, and so Frank Vidyke has this famous list of 100 theorems. Um, he claims it's elementary, but you know, Fermat's last theorem is on there. Uh, and uh, most of them have been formalized. In fact, most of them have been formalized by John Harrison. Uh, but one of them has not been, and it's the independence of CH. So of course, when I saw this, I thought, well, that can't be right, right? Because as uh, someone trained in mathematical logic, right, something that you, um, you sort of learn early on is that uh, the forcing argument for the independence of CH is sort of like this ex nihilo argument, right? Like it's sort of elementary. Uh, it's something that you could uh, teach in a first year graduate course on set theory. And so I was really surprised when uh, that hadn't been done. And I saw, thought, well, that should be easy, right? So let's try to formalize it. Uh, so now it has been formalized, uh, whence the fly pitch project. Uh, so we, we did the independence of CH. Uh, we did it in Lean 3. And we wrote it in a modular way such that uh, people can continue using our implementation of first order logic and model theory. So if you want to keep on doing model theory, you know, do the hyperreals the right way, uh, then you can because it's all available. Um, OK, so I mean, we've already seen a talk at this conference about um, someone just stating something, right? They wanted to say what a perfectoid space was, and they wanted Lean to understand it. So what do we have to do to make Lean understand the statement of the independence of CH? Right, so first, you have to start with a deep embedding of first order logic. Right. You need a notion of terms, formulas, free variables, bound variables. Right. You need a proof system. You have to be able to say what it means for ZFC to prove CH or not CH. And you also need the axioms of ZFC and CH as first order formulas. Um, that's just a statement. But for the proof, you have to do forcing. Right. And to do forcing, you need models of ZFC. So you have to talk about model theory. You need the soundness theorem. We use Boolean valued models. Uh, and so we needed a Boolean valued soundness theorem and semantics for first order logic. Um, and we had to do forcing, which uh, could take up an entire slide with all the things we have to throw in. Um, yeah, so these are all the ingredients that we had to do, and they have all been formalized. Okay, so let's start with syntax. Um, so we implemented languages as structures with uh, two fields. Right. These are uh, NAT indexed families of types where the uh, NAT parameter uh, is the arity. Right. And so for an example, this is the language of Abelian groups. Right. You have a single symbol zero, which is a constant, it's zero ary, and a plus symbol, which is binary. Right. And then uh, you can bundle this into a language for Abelian groups right, by just um, making the second field point at the empty type. Okay. Um, so, we implemented uh, terms in first order logic in sort of a special way. Um, we used partially applied terms. Um, these things are parameterized by a natural number that says uh, how far away they are from being fully applied. So if you have a k-ary function symbol, right, then that becomes a preterm at level k. And then when you apply it to a uh, single term, right, that fills in an argument and th that brings it down to k minus one and so on. And so the terms are just uh, preterms at level zero. Um, so what this means is that all our terms are well-formed uh, just by type checking, right? We don't have to carry on extra proofs of well-formedness. We don't have to apply our uh, function symbols to vectors of terms and carry around proofs that the vectors are the right length. It's just baked into the type system. And that was really nice. Um, and we used a similar trick for formulas. Um, so 
to stress test our implementation, uh, we started off with the formalization of the completeness and compactness theorems. And uh, we found that our implementation of first order logic really made those proofs uh, more pleasant than they might have been otherwise. Um, and when it came time to write down ZFC, uh, we ended up um, adding some new function symbols for convenience. I mean, these are things that, you know, set theorists add on like page one of a set theory textbook, right? Like you can define them in the language of ZFC, so you just add them in, and then for the rest of the textbook, you're really working in this expanded language. Um, but once you have these, it becomes rather easy to formulate the continuum hypothesis, right? You just have to say that something is an ordinal, um, and you have this less than or equal sign, which means that there exists a surjection from a subset of the set on the right. So that is what CH means to us. Um, and ZFC is what you normally think of as ZFC, uh, but we also specify what these function symbols mean. Um, okay, so time for forcing. Uh, so typically forcing arguments uh, follow this shape, right? You have a poset, right, P, or a Boolean algebra that completes P, right? And you, uh, you typically start with a ground model of set theory. Right. And first, you have to construct a class or a set of names, right? P names or B names. And if you're forcing with filters, you select some, some kind of filter G inside P, and this evaluates the P names, uh, which produces a forcing extension uh, that you later have to check is a model of ZFC and that you have forced something to be true inside the model. Um, in the case of Boolean value models, you don't evaluate the names at all. Instead, you take the B names and you just try to treat them as a model of ZFC. The price you have to pay for this is that you have to move away from two-valued logic, and you have to work in a logic where the truth values take place in B instead. Um, so those are the two paths available to us. Um, but a major problem for a, a user of a proof assistant that uses type theory like Lean is that when you look at the textbooks, everything is done in set theory. And at first glance, it seems like you can't take the set theory out, right? Like if you go one page into Kunin's chapter on forcing, well, actually, I think this is Yak, uh, right? You see, well, okay, this is fine, right? Like if, uh, so if P is a type, then you can just talk about, you know, a predicate on P, this is okay, right? But now if you look at this, right, well, this won't type check, right? Like what does it mean to take the intersection of two types? Like, so, so I mean, if M is already a type, right, then this means that you would be looking at terms inside of M that you think of as sets, but that means that you have to internalize the forcing argument to M. And that's something that you might not want to do uh, because you want to make proofs as easy as possible, right? You don't want to fight the type system. Um, similar way for P names, right? I mean, this, Kunin claims that this must be understood by transfinite recursion, which is like, yikes, right? Because when you're working inside a type theory, you don't really want to do transfinite stuff, right? You want to work with inductive types instead. Um, right. And uh, now if you look at the uh, formulation of Boolean valued models, right, there's another transfinite induction on rank, right? You start with a universe of sets to begin with, which is, you know, already not so good if you're looking to translate things into type theory, and then you do a transfinite induction on rank, and you end up with something like this. Okay, so that was the first challenge. We had to figure out how to encode the forcing argument, which is typically phrased inside of set theory, and we have to do, find a way to do it inside of type theory. Okay, so naively, right, you could just fix a model of ZFC, or maybe you just assume one as an axiom, and then you just replicate all the arguments word for word, right? Yikes, we don't want to do that. Uh, so. The important question is, do we have to internalize all the arguments into some model of set theory? Because if we do, that means the proofs get much slower and possibly much uglier. Okay, the answer is no. So we use the Boolean valued model approach to avoid having to use filters, right? That makes the argument simpler. Um, and the key observation in implementing the forcing extension is that to define uh, the Boolean valued universe, VB, right, the, the B names, we can naturally find a way to implement this as an inductive type, which generalizes the Axel sets. Uh, so Peter Axel came up with a way to encode a model of ZFC in a type theory, like Lean's. Um, so this is due to Axel, right? So it's very simple. One constructor with two fields, right? There's a type which indexes um, a family of P sets. So you can think of this as being an inductive type of trees of trees formed from a universe of types. 
right? And um, you can define a notion of equivalence um, through structural recursion, right? Um, these are presets because you still have to quotient by, this, uh, by that equivalence. But once you do, you have a model of ZFC. You can show that that's a model of ZFC, okay? Uh, this is like uh, the cumulative hierarchy, right? Because the empty set always exists, right? Because the empty type will always emit the empty map into any other type. So that kicks off the process. Okay, so what we did was we add a third field for Boolean truth values, right? So now you have this, uh, this type which indexes a family of presets, but you additionally tag everything with a Boolean truth value, right? So these are the B names, right? This generalizes P set because when you take B to be the singleton algebra, then B set unit is isomorphic to P set because there's no extra information coming from the third field, right? Uh, and P set embeds into B set because you can recursively attach the, uh, the truth value uh, true, one, onto everything. Um, so this is the correct way to implement the B names inside of type theory. Okay, um, and uh, you can similarly talk about what it means for two Boolean valued sets to be equal, except now the truth values are taking place inside of B, right? So the infimum and the supremum here are the operations inside the complete uh, B here, right? And you do it by recursion. And uh, once you have equality, then you can define membership in terms of equality. There just has to exist something inside the set that's equal to the thing that you're trying to say is a member of the set, okay? And the fundamental theorem of forcing for Boolean valued models is that for every complete B, B set B is a Boolean valued model of set theory. So here's a high level view of the proof since I don't have time to go into details. Uh, so typically you force not CH using the Cohen poset, right? Using a filter, which you show is dense somehow. Um, and then to show CH, um, to force CH, well, you don't force CH. To construct a model where CH is true, uh, you follow Gödel's proof and you just build L and you verify that CH is true in L. Um, we did something different. So we took the Boolean valid approach, right, um, which is straightforward enough, but we don't construct L. Instead, we also force CH through another forcing argument, okay? Um, the two arguments are not that similar. So there was a lot of work that had to be done in each case that was not transferable to the other. Um, so to do forcing, you have to analyze the structure of B, right? When you just have a random B, the only thing that you know about B set B is that that's a Boolean valued model of ZFC. But once you actually fix a B, the structure of B will affect how you can form subsets in the new model of set theory, right? So you have to, to understand the combinatorics of B and you have to figure out how that affects the notion of the ordinals and cardinals inside of B set B, right? Um, so here, here's a diagram of the three large types in play, right? There's P set, which is the ordinary model of ZFC, um, and that embeds into B set through the check map, right? Uh, these ordinals are the ordinals inside of lean, so these are equivalence classes of well-ordered types. These index the ordinals inside of P set. Um, so the ordinals in lean embed into P set, and then these further embed into B set. Um, so that's sort of how they interact. So to do forcing, you have to understand uh, how this B will affect the structure of the ordinals in here and somehow pull it back to lean and uh, show that that somehow forces uh, certain cardinalities to be equal. Okay, and uh, furthermore, we had to redevelop basic set theory, but completely internal to B set B. We had to talk about the theory of ordinals, we had to construct Aleph 1, but internally inside of that model of set theory. Okay. Um, so the two algebras that we use to form the forcing extensions are given here. So for cone forcing, we used an algebra of regular open sets in a Cantor space. Um, and uh, since you form subsets by giving um, an indicator function to the Boolean algebra, right, then by our very choice of uh, the Boolean algebra, then we can uh, give the, the graph of an injection uh, from Aleph 2 uh, into the power set of omega. And similarly to for CH, uh, we, can take a, we can take an algebra um, of the function space of Aleph 1 to the power set of omega. And we can similarly, uh, simply by construction, uh, find an indicator function which represents a surjection from Aleph 1 onto the power set of omega. Um, 
So one thing that we found really helpful and which was crucial for uh, the formalization was being to automate proofs and Boolean valued logic. Right? One reason uh, why um, some people don't like the Boolean valued approach is that you end up having to calculate these Boolean truth values all the time and it becomes really tedious. And so uh, one positive aspect of doing this inside of a proof assistant is that the proof assistant can handle all of the bookkeeping for you. Right? Um, but to do that, you have to write some automation. Right? So, so if you have a goal like this, which just looks like you, know, you apply modus ponens twice, right? well, if you just look at this as terms in a Boolean algebra, you start rewriting and simplifying. Maybe you even have a lemma from a, for, um, uh, for MP. Right? You still have to do a bunch of stuff where you rewrite by the commutativity of the enthemum, uh, transitivity arguments, and so on. So I mean, this looks much more complicated than it has to be. Um, but once you use the metaprogramming capabilities of Lean, you can simply write something like a Boolean value tableau prover, and then it just takes care of it in a single line. Uh, so that was really helpful. Um, one thing that was also crucial for shortening some proofs was uh, using the fact that quotients are built into Lean's type theory, right? Um, because if we get to a point where we're uh, replaying a first order proof but inside a Boolean valued logic and we just have to do some equality reasoning, right? Like there's a chain of equalities, but these are Boolean valued equalities in context somewhere. We just have to chain them together, rewrite some memberships, right? Then you can just quotient by the appropriate setoid and call congruence closure. Um, and it's easy to wrap this into a single tactic, which uh, will do it for you. Um, okay, so to sum up, uh, when I first saw this problem, I thought it was going to be easy. Uh, and was it as easy as I hoped? Well, it took 20,000 lines of code in one year, so maybe not as easy as I hoped. Uh, one interesting aspect of this is that uh, by translating this into type theory, Right. We found that you don't really need a ground model of set theory to do forcing at all. Right. You can just construct the Boolean valued model of ZFC in one go, and you can just do the forcing argument there. You don't have to start with a model of ZFC. Um, we had to overcome the fact that all the accounts of forcing are done in set theory, and so we have to figure out exactly what parts of the arguments are the mathematical parts that can be translated into type theory, and what parts of them are just purely set theoretic. Um, Lean really helped when we were trying to translate all this. The automation helped. Um, and being able to write our own tactics like we did for Boolean valued logic was absolutely crucial. Um, thank you for your attention. Again, we have time for questions. Uh, let's start here. More a remark than a question, but you say that uh, <coughs> all forcing has been done uh, through set theory, but there's like a, a whole bunch of people in classical risibility, and they had like a lot of uh, type theoretic views on this kind of arguments. Uh, so that would probably have helped. Uh, in ah, um, yeah, I, so I briefly looked at that. I wasn't able to find any sources on the independence of CH. Um, so I guess my remarks should be uh, confined to just trying to find accounts of that particular forcing argument. I think that I've seen people writing uh, the negation of CH in, in classical reasonability, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the proof of CH, um, I, don't, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. Um, I would definitely be interested in seeing that, so, so we can talk later. So um, in your work, you proved the independency of CH from ZFC. And do you think it would be significantly different to prove the independency of CH from Lean itself? Yes. Right. I'm not sure exactly how one would start doing that, um, but it seems harder because Lean is stronger than ZFC, right? Has inaccessible cardinals and, <coughs> and so on. Right, and, but surely uh, a similar Boolean valued model does exist for Lean, right? Well, I don't know. It might. It probably does. I think it would be a lot more work. Basically the same question, but with a suggestion for an answer. Okay. So, so if you look at um, the book by McLean and Mordek, they give a sketch on a uh, topos theoretic presentation of uh, the independence. Mm -hmm. And right. this can be uh, probably be lifted to a higher topos version, and then you can use the machinery that has been developed in HOT uh, to get 
uh, hopefully Boolean valued models for type theory. So that would be an approach that hmm. might work. And that's related to what, what the technology that has been developed in Nantes, where uh, type theoretic for forcing, and also the modalities that people have been developing uh, hmm. that you can find in the hot book and in our papers. So do you still want an answer to that? Sorry? Because you said you wanted an answer at the beginning. No, no. So, so these would be some um, building blocks towards, oh, okay. uh, towards building that technology. Right. Um, yeah, so I actually wanted to use the topos theoretic approach to begin with. Um, but I saw that it might be too hard, because uh, one thing that's left implicit is there's a soundness theorem for intuitionistic logic. Right? You have to show that the semantics inside of a topos makes sense. Um, and that seems strictly harder than just sh showing a Boolean valued soundness theorem. Um, yeah, but great work. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned why Boolean valued model approach is a nice fit for type theory and lean. Do you have any thoughts after this about uh, how painful in comparison it would be to do a proof with generic filters and something like Isabel ZF? Um, in Isabel ZF. So I know that there is a current line of work, uh, there were some people who were working on this. Uh, they started on verifying um, that approach on Isabel ZF, building off of Larry Paulson's work. I don't know if they're still working on it, um, but I could point you to some references after. Um, but I'm not, I haven't worked with Isabel, so I don't think I would be able to give an informed opinion on exactly how hard it would be. So in the in the signature you used to represent ZF, uh -huh. there were no constants for separation and replacement, and I guess this is because these operations again rely on formulas. But have you thought about combining those so that terms can depend on formulas, and so you have a um, a constant for for separation and replacement available? And would that have helped, or was it okay to have them implicit just by the existential axiom you assume? Um. Yeah, we never found a need to do that. Uh, Floris mm -hmm. might have something to say. No, he doesn't have anything to say about it. Uh, okay. Yeah, that wasn't something that we thought about. OK. I think we've come to the end of this talk and the questions. So let's thank Jesse once more.